What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to part three of my review of my friend Matt's Cube. You might also know him as Elk Tears if you've been a fan of the stream. Uh, do me a favor at the beginning of this video. If you are a fan of the content, if you guys watch regularly, make sure to subscribe if you're not already subscribed. I'm trying to amass some subscribers. Uh, my channel has been stagnant for quite a while, but I do get regular views and I'm just trying to see if I can, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Invigorate some subscribing. So definitely give a subscribe if you enjoy, enjoy the content. It's a great way to help the channel, promote the algorithm. And now we're gonna look at the cube. Uh, last time we went over the black and red cards. Time before that we went over the white and blue cards. Today we're gonna go over green and colorless. And then for the final part on Thursday, we'll be going over multicolored and lands. So I also have my cube up as well. I can go here and back up a little bit. I was just going over some of the cards, some of the differences here that we're going to see. So in terms of one drops here, pretty much have the same Arbor Elf, Birds, Halfling, Reclaimer, Findhorn, Hexdrinker. Two Hierarchs, a Llanowar Elf, and a Draga Tree Speaker. I have a very similar configuration, only my configuration uh, does not have Findhorn Elves. I think it's just a little too redundant. All of these other Elves do something. Noble Hierarch and Ignoble Hierarch are both Exalters that tap for three different kinds of mana. Tree Speaker taps for two. Uh, Reclaimer doesn't tap for mana. Delighted Halfling can make legendary creatures uncounterable. Birds taps for all colors. Arbor Elf, they all do other things. Finhorn Elves is just a copy of Llanowar Elves. And with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mana dorks, I think I was, I was just fine with seven. I didn't really need eight of them. So I just, it was an easy cut. It's just a little redundancy that's not necessary, I think. So for two drops, we have Devoted Druid, Fauna Shaman, Lotus Cobra, or Felos, Sakura, Scavenging Ooze, Sylvan, and Wall of Roots. I have almost all of these except for Fauna Shaman and Lotus Cobra. I think Fauna Shaman... So Survival of the Fittest is a card that doesn't see a ton of play in the cube. Um, so Fauna Shaman is actually just a significantly worse Survival of the Fittest. And Survival of the Fittest goes extremely late sometimes. Like, you really don't want Survival that often. You have much better ways to tutor cards in your deck if you're trying to do that. And the discard decks that want a discard outlet are usually not green. They're usually either black-red or black-blue. So Survival's kind of in a weird position, which makes Fauna Shaman even worse because you can only use it once a turn. It's susceptible to creature removal, and you can't use it the turn it comes into play. So having two of this effect just seems like unnecessary. Uh, Lotus Cobra, I was, I had Lotus Cobra for a long time and I'm kind of down on Lotus Cobra. Lotus Cobra is a mana creature that's, that's good when you have lands in hand and it's better when you have like fetch lands. But if you don't have any lands, it's just a bad mana creature and that's really not great for green. It's nice that it produces other colors but it's just, there's so many better options for adding mana, like like Wall of Roots or Sylvan Cariad or Scrow Tribe Builder. Devoted Druid, they all do better things and they're a lot easier to get going, so. But then we have, in my cube, I took those two out and I only have one replacement. I have Shy Geki, Jukai Visionary. So you can tap two and it to return Shy Geki, Jukai Visionary to its owner's hand, reveal the top four cards of your library, put a land card from among them onto the battlefield tapped, and then you can put the rest in the graveyard. So this actually I put in there in order to supplement the Dark Depths, Thespian Stage, Hex Mage combo. There's also Crop Rotation. So this is nice because it's just another way to get lands into play. Or to like search, kind of search through your library for specific lands and put them out when you want like either Dark Depths or Thespian Stage or something. Um, also the channel's nice. You can discard them to return X target non-legendary cards from your graveyard to your hand. So, I mean, that's just nice that instant speed get back like... Woodfall Primus and, you know, Elder Gargaroth or something at the end of their turn. So it's just a nice kind of like, and you can always bounce him, put a land into play and then channel or something. So a little, it's a, it's a versatile little creature. Three drops. We have Augur of Autumn, Courser, Endurance, Eternal Witness, Manglehorn, Excavator, Rex Sage, and Tireless Tracker. I have Augur and I took out Courser. I'm tempted to put Courser back because I think Courser is really, really good. But I also thought Augur of Autumn was kind of doing that same thing. And I'm a big fan of not having a ton of redundancy in my queue. I'd rather have more cards that do different things 
in different situations than have like three or four copies of the same cards that do the same things. Like, I don't think you're building decks that want like four of this spell, five of three of this spell, you know, it's just like, I'd rather have, I'd rather be past an Augur on and take it and then be past a different card than, than Corsair of Crufix. So I don't have two of that effect. Like, I just don't think it's necessary. That being said, I think Corsair is really good and I like it a lot. I do like the third ability on Augur of Autumn. The, as long as you control three different cre three or more creatures with different powers, you can cast creatures off the top as well. But I think being able to play lands off the top is important. And you also have Oracle of Maldaya. So you have three of this effect. It's just a lot. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. It gets a lot. And Endurance, I'm not 100% on. Like, I just also think it's kind of meh. I think it was a cute addition. I think a 3-4 flash reach for 3 is really good. And I think Exile in the Graveyard is fine. But I'm not 100% on it. I don't think it's I don't think it's super necessary. There's also Manglehorn. I had Manglehorn in for a while, but I like having uh artifact or enchantment destruction rather than just artifact destruction. The fact that Manglehorn can't kill an enchantment is kind of a big deal for me. One of the cards I have in instead, uh, this is a card I actually like a lot, the Owlin' Liberator. Um, so you can destroy an artifact or enchantment with it, obviously, but then the transform is whenever it attacks, you destroy an artifact or enchantment. So I think that's actually, I would play that over Manglehorn like almost every time. Like, I think it's, I think it's rare that you're going to want to be able to kill an artifact with Manglehorn and need their artifacts to come into play untapped. Like, there are some good artifact decks, but, like, I don't know. I feel like it doesn't come up enough. I'd rather have the versatility to destroy, like, an Opposition or a Treachery or a Bitter Blossom or something. I think that versatility is really important. The other card I have that kind of replaces both Endurance and Manglehorn is Tranquil Frillback, which is a 3-mana three 3-3. Three, three. And if you, it essentially has Multi-Kicker. When it enters the battlefield, you may pay green up to three times. When you pay this, I wonder why it doesn't just say multi-kicker green. When you pay this card's kicker cost, choose up to that many. So destroy an artifact, I guess maybe because it's like there's no cap on multi-kicker. That's probably why. Destroy an artifact or enchantment, exile a graveyard, or gain four life. So this is kind of doing a lot of that. Like this even kind of takes the place of an acidic, acidic slime if you if you don't care about the uh, destruction of a land. But yeah, getting a three three for four mana that destroys an artifact, or getting a that excels a graveyard or gains you four is pretty sweet. Again, I think the versatility of that guy is really good, so it kind of puts him on my radar. Other than that, uh, I also have Dryad of the Elysian Grove. That was the other card I have that lets you play two lands. Um, I think Ren and Realm Breaker is kind of poop. I noticed Matt does not have Ren and Realm Breaker either, but like every time I played Ren and Realm Breaker, I was like, this isn't impressive. It doesn't untap the land, so it can't protect itself. So basically you play it on turn three and then they get to attack it if they want to, or so it's just not super impressive. And like, as far as cards that let you tap your land for any color mana, I like the two, four of the Dryad better. Plus it goes well, it goes better with like, um, Augur of Autumn, Corsair of Crufix, or Oracle of Moldiah allowing you to play an additional land each turn. So it's kind of like, and like a, a lot of like the vintage cube on MTGO is playing exploration, which also lets you play two lands, but I'd much rather have Dryad because it fixes your mana and I have a five color archetype in my cube. So that's just kind of better for me. Magus of the Order. I'm actually really surprised to see that in here because that's kind of doo-doo. Um, <laughs> that's like these creatures and Toski as well. Like both of those are kind of, Kind of meh. Really interesting. I only have three four drops, and, and I have the same ones. I have Oracle, Questing Beast, and Under Mountain Adventurer. So I have Oracle, Questing Beast, and Under. Like, I don't have Magus of the Order. I think this card is just kind of unimpressive. It's a 3-3 three, three for four. And then you have to sacrifice it and another creature to search your library for a green card. Like, it's just, it's just natural, or obviously, but you're paying five mana over time. It's the same thing with Fauna Shaman, where, like, it's these modern cards that are doing vintage cube type things, but they're like, you're got to take a turn off and then they have to survive. <laughs> like, I don't know. I've never, I've never been in a situation where I was like, man, I have a natural order 
but I wish I had a second natural or that was just worse. Like, I think this, I think I've never drafted this card and I've never played against anyone who's drafted it. And the same thing with Toski. Like, I, I think Toski's a fine card in like a legacy cube or a modern cube, but like a one, one for four mana. I would much rather have Edric because he's three mana and he's a two, two. Like coming down on turn four, it's just like there's so many powerful plays to make on turn four, like Minsk and Boo or Questing Beast or Jace the Mind Sculptor, you know, things like Opposition. Like this is not what you want to be doing on turn four. It's just a really, it's a cute card, but I think it's, I think it's underpowered for sure. Uh, five drops. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. Matt looks like he has five. I have Acidic Slime. I have, I have um deep forest hermit instead of deranged hermit i think it's just strictly better <laughs> um your your hermit your deranged hermit itself is like never going to stick around more than three or four turns anyway so there's no reason that you would want to pay echo over just having it have vanishing like if i can just play deranged hermit and never have to worry about the uh, the echo that's just ideal i never want to be like well, I guess I'll pay the echo. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Can't do anything else this turn. Like having to pay echo is just such a feel bad thing. Like, you know, you're just going to lose your one, one and four power from your squirrels. Whereas like deep forest hermit just comes down and he gets to stay there. And I think that's a totally reasonable, uh, conclusion <laughs> for a five mana green card. So I don't think it's like, I definitely don't think it's overpowered and it's a lot nicer <laughs> especially because Matt does have blink cards like ephemerate or he said, he said he was adding touch the spirit realm. So if you have those blink cards, like not having to pay echo and being able to have your mana free so you can blink your hermit is just so much better. Also have elder Gargaroth also have Thrag Tusk also have Titania. Uh, the one card I have that Matt does not is Vorin clicks. This five mana Vorin clicks. This was in the cube for a brief period and I was super, super impressed by it. And I'm kind of disappointed they took it out. It's 6-6 six, six for 5 with Trample and Reach. When it enters the battlefield, you draw two forests from your deck. Uh, not even basic forests. So you can get Breeding Pool. You can get tr you can get tri lands and cycle them. Um, so it, it kind of draws you two cards. <laughs> so it's kind of a big deal. It's like a Mall Drifter, but 6-6. Uh, six, six. And then for 8 mana, which is not hard to do when you're a green deck, you exile it. And then you mill 10 cards, put up to two creatures from among them onto the battlefield. That's a very... In Green's Wheelhouse, that's very tooth and nail, that's very natural, or that's very kind of what it wants to do. Ten cards is a lot in a limited deck. And you're getting two creatures. Then you distribute seven counters among any number of creatures you control. <laughs> it's basically like a mini overrun kind of effect. Seven counters is a lot. And then until end of turn, your creatures get tap one and it fights another creature you don't control. And then you just get Vorinclex back and draw two more fours. Like, this is so much value for, for five mana. Like, it's so sweet. Like... I think a lot of these uh, these saga praetors are really really cool, and I have a bunch of them in my cube. So yeah, I would be I, I mean I would definitely play that over like Toski or Magus of the Order. Like it just seems like a objectively more powerful card. So six drops. I have Primeval Titan and Gruff Triplets. I'm tempted to put Kogla, and Kogla is definitely on the fence for me. Uh, it's a card I'm looking for a spot. I'm also looking for a spot for Haywire Might. And I just worry that I'm going to have too many cards that are just like destroy an artifact or enchantment, destroy an artifact or enchantment, destroy an art. It's like, it's just so many. So I'm trying to figure out where the sweet spot is, but Gruff Triplets is interesting. This is a card from Wilds of Eldraine. It's a three, three for six. Unimpressive, right? But it has trample. When it enters the battlefield, if it isn't a token, create two tokens that are copies of it. So you get three, three, threes. When this dies, when a Gruff Triplet dies, so all, any, any of the three, Put a number of 1-1 counters equal to its power on each creature named Gruff's Triplets. So if one of the three dies, your other two become 6-6s. Six if one of the 6-6s six dies, then you have a 12-12. So you go 3-3-3s, three, 2-6-6s, three, three, six, six, or 1-12-12. Twelve, twelve. I mean, obviously, that yes, they can bounce a token, but like Precursor Golem is not terrible. And this has kind of like a really, like you just don't want to dismember one of them because then you make two six sixes with Trample. It's kind of an interesting card. I don't know if it's great, but it's a card I'm looking at right now and trying out. Matt has Titan of Industry and Hornet Queen as his seven drops. 
I'm not a big Titan of Industry fan. I think it's kind of meh. Again, it destroys an artifact or an enchantment. Great. Gains five life. Great. Put a shield counter on a creature. Great. Like none of the, none of the effects are really impressive. When I first saw this, I was excited by making two four fours, but then I realized you couldn't do that. <laughs> so then I was like, it's a seven, seven and a four, four. Eh. So I actually have Tyranax Rex in my cube as my, as my other seven drop along with Hornet Queen. Can't be countered. It's an eight, eight for seven. Trample, Ward 4, Haste, and Toxic 4. This is like a larger uh, Carnage Tyrant. And that's I think that's kind of cool. It's just nice to have this big fat idiot. So like Ward 4, like if they want to treachery it, it's going to cost them 9 mana. If they want to dismember it, it's going to cost them, I guess, 5. But it's not going to die. Like, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, Ward 4 is a lot. Plus you're dealing Toxic Damage. It's got Trample. It can't be countered. Like, it's got a lot going on. So it's just kind of a big dumb idiot that could win the game in a few turns. So, yeah, I just think, I think, I, I think Titan of Industry is just a card I, like, it's seven mana, I just don't really care about it. I don't know. Because again, then you have, like, Woodfall Primus that does the same thing. So I have three of the same. I have Crater Hoof, I have Woodfall, and I have World Spine Worm. I also have Apex Devastator in my cube. Cascade, 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 Cascade. It is a ten mana card that you cascade four times. Ah, this card's just super cool. I mean, it doesn't have trample, but you're getting five cards out of it. In a green deck with big fat idiots, you have to hit something. So it's just kind of cool to natural order into this or tooth and nail into this or whatever. Like you can even apex devastator into like a natural order and then sacrifice something else or hit, you can hit tooth and nail because it costs 10 mana. So like, I mean, the sky's the pretty much the limit. It, it can hit almost any card in your green deck except for World Spine Worm. So, I don't know. That's been a, It's been a, a cool addition. And I'm surprised I don't see it in other decks. So, I have Garrick Wildspeaker. I don't have Nissa Who Shakes the World because I think at the time she was just seeming a little too powerful. Like, this was the time where, like, she was really, really strong and standard. And I just didn't... I didn't think the play pattern on Nissa was very fun. There wasn't a lot of interactivity She's just kind of a big, stupid ramp creature that pressures your opponent. I don't know. I think she's kind of a boring design. She's just very, very good. I don't know. I also have Nista Ascendant Animus, which I think has been very good. Uh, this is another card that has a lot of versatility. You can cast it at five, six, or seven with different effects, depending on you know how many loyalties she comes in with. Um, the two I have in addition are Ren and Seven. So right in the middle. So you got reveal the top four cards of your library, put all land revealed this way into your hand and the rest in your graveyard. So you can plus one, probably draw two cards. Put any number of lands from your hand onto the battlefield. Negative three, you get a tree folk token with reach, uh, with power and toughness equal to the number of lands you control. So very land centric. And negative eight is return all permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand. You get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size. So kind of land based, but also makes tree folks to protect itself. It draws you cards. Yeah, I don't know. Ren and Seven seems cool. Um, next, I have Vivian on the Hunt. We'll do Viv Hunt. Which is basically my Birthing Pod compromise. Because I think Birthing Pod is trash in cubes. So plus two, you may sacrifice a creature if you do search your library for a creature card with mana value equal to one plus the creature's mana value put onto the battlefield. So you get you get your birthing pot effect. But you can also plus one to mill five, then put any number of creature cards into your hand. So you're just drawing however many creature cards in the top five. And then negative one, you can just also just make four force. I mean, very versatile again, does a lot of things, protects herself. You know, if you play it after, like if you play Acidic Slime into Vivian on the Hunt, you can sacrifice the Acidic Slime, make a Primeval Titan plus two or so those are the planeswalkers I have. Uh, what do we got here? Ch -ch -ch -ch. Next we're on crop rotation and tear asunder. I have the same thing. I also added paradise lost, which is kind of a funny, uh, funny name. So you roll two six sided dice, return any number of cards with total mana value X or less from your graveyard to your hand where X is the total of those results. Exile Pair of Dice Lost. If you hit anything close to a seven, you're probably getting back whatever card you want, plus a couple of cheaper cards. Like 
Mana Crypt, Soul Ring, Two Lands, things like that. Like this is often going to draw you three or four cards from your graveyard, depending on what you hit. And it's an instant, so you could do it at the end of their turn. It's a very good regrowth effect, which I have instead of regrowth. <laughs> Looks like Matt has regrowth as well. Um, yeah, so those are my three, same three instants except for Paradise Lost here. I have Green Sun, I have Pest. Tempted to cut Pest. I think it's very, very strong, almost too strong. I have Channel. I don't have Farseek. I think you just have enough non-spell cards that do this effect. I don't have Finale. I cut Finale because I think there's a lot of redundancy. I have Invasion of Ikoria instead, which is basically the exact same thing, only it's a battle, so you can kill the battle and get a creature out of it, which I think is a lot more attainable than making X 10 or more. So I just think it's a, it's a, it's a card you're going to get the upside off of more frequently. I don't have life from the loam because I think the archetypes that use life from the loam are kind of meh. Like I think it's like Matt loves these rare situations where someone does this one thing and like, you know, it's like, oh man, he got back, he got back to these three lands and he put them in the, they cycled them again. And they got him. like, it's like, yeah, sure. That's going to happen like one out of every hundred games. But like, other than that, Life from the Loam is going to be the 14th pick, I think. Regrowth is fine. Um, I think I took it out, again, because of, like, redundancy. Like, I had Eternal Witness, and I think I had something else. I had Invasion of Chandelar instead of Paradise Lost. So I always had two. And Invasion of Chandelar is... Uh, return up to three permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand. So it's a similar effect. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you may put a permanent card from your hand onto the battlefield. But you just couldn't get things like Ancestral Recall or, you know, Time Walk, which are the things you want to regrowth the most. And there's Natural Order and Tooth and Nail. I have both of those. I also do have Eureka in my cube because I think Eureka is super fun. And it's one of the cards that are not like Show and Tell, despite appearing like Show and Tell. Show and Tell, if you put an Emrakul into play and they put an Oblivion Ring in play, you're done. If they put a Sower into play or a Treachery into play, you're done. Your one-for-one one cards get wrecked. The good thing about Eureka is that you build around it. So there's been times where I put like a Garrick, an Avenger of Zendikar, um, an Ugin, and something else into play. And when you're building around Eureka, your permanents in bulk are going to be better than their permanents, 100%. As long as you build around it and sculpt your hand in such a way that your Eureka is going to be better than theirs. It's a very, very good card. And it's very fun to build around. Uh, Matt has a Seeker's Chariot and Great Henge. I have Conduit of Worlds and a Seeker's Chariot. Conduit of Worlds is my replacement for Crucible of Worlds. Play lands from your graveyard. Same thing, except it costs four. But you can also choose a non-land permanent in your graveyard. If you haven't cast a spell this turn, you can cast that card. If you do, you can't cast any additional spells. But if you're drawing dead and you have a graveyard full of like Planeswalkers or a Primeval Titan or Hornet Queen or something, you can just keep casting it. They have to exile those cards or else you just keep getting to cast the best cards from your graveyard. So, enchantments. Matt has seven. I have three. I have Fast Bond, Sylvan Library, and Pattern of Rebirth. Pattern of Rebirth is pretty cool. You can either combo with it and kill your own creature. When an enchanted creature dies, that creature's controller may search their library for a creature card, put that card on the battlefield, and shuffle. So it's just another search effect like Tooth and Nail or Natural Order, but it's any creature. It's not just green creatures, and it's only four mana. So basically, you can put it on like a mana dork and then either sacrifice it to something or just kill it yourself. And then go find an Emrakul or something. You could do it at the end of the turn. You could be go end of turn Fatal Push. And then it's just kind of a really powerful card that enables some combos. So Matt has Exploration, which I have been extremely unimpressed with every time I've played it. I mean, Fast Bond is really, really not great unless you're building around it. There's very few situations where you have so many lands in your hand and Fast Bond and a threat to play that it really benefits you. Like you want fast bond when you have upheaval or when you can play cards at the top of your library, or if you have like bolus of Citadel cards where you're going to be able to play a bunch of lands from different zones in order to clear them away. Exploration is just kind of meh. Like how many lands do you need to play extra for exploration to be good? Two, three. 
So you have to have like six total lands before exploration is even good. I just don't think exploration is great. Unless you're doing the fast bond thing, but I don't think that deck comes up enough that you want both. And again, like I have Dryad of Vilicene Grove, which is three mana instead of one, but it feels like it does more. I don't love Utopia Sprawl. Every time I've played it, I felt like I didn't have enough forests. And in the green decks that have a ton of forests, like 10, 12, 15, 16 full forests, I don't care about Utopia Sprawl. I'd much rather have Mana Dorks. Um, Because the benefit of this is that it lets you play another color and splash off of it, but like it has to go on a forest. So I don't know. It's kind of meh. Fertile Ground is better because you could you don't have to choose and it doesn't have to go on a forest. So it takes like the worst parts of uh, Utopia Sprawl and removes them. I also don't have Oath because I had Oath and it was just never fun. <laughs> the Oath decks never do well. The oath, it, takes, it takes so much work to have a good Oath deck. It's, it's so easy for your opponent to take advantage of Oath like when you have it. It's just, it's kind of meh. I don't know. Like it's, it's a card that like, I really want to be good and it's a super cool historic magic card. But again, like it's not creating fun games. No one's building an oath deck and like having success with it. They're like, Oh cool. I'll put my Eldrazi into play and I milled 14 cards. And then you're like, all right, I'll bounce it. Now it's in your hand. And you're like, Oh no, I only have like one shitty creature left. I'm like, it just, it doesn't produce very fun games. I think survival is fine. And Sylvan library is obviously great. So those are my, op those are my, uh, oh, I also have, I have two, two invasions, which Matt doesn't have. I have invasion of Ikoria, as I mentioned, and I also have invasion of Ixalan, which is two mana. When it enters the battlefield, look at the top five cards of your library. You can reveal a permanent card from among them and put it in your hand, put the rest in the bottom in any, in a random order. So it's, it's kind of like a, an oath of Nyssa. It's kind of like a green kind of, it's just like a green impulse, right? Where it gets you, um, uh, no, uh, just you look at the top five and get a permanent and then it becomes a four three whenever you cast a spell it gains indestructible until end of turn and you just get a four three for four i don't know i could see oath of nissa being cooler or there was another one that's also pretty good i can't think of it off the top of my head though but that's that's my green for now i could see invasion of ixalan being on the chopping block though so for colorless he has hangerback and walking ballista i don't have hangerback i think it's a fine addition i just don't care about it <laughs> like i don't think it it just kind of exists it doesn't really fit into any specific archetypes that i really care about um so yeah i just cut it i wanted more space and i think like there's enough x spells and things i don't have bomat courier either because it's just, again, it's an unimpressive card. Like, it's fine. You, maybe maybe every so often you'll draw, like, three or four cards off of it. But it has to go in the red deck. I think it's heavily competing with a bunch of red cards. And I just don't think it's the most powerful one drop. Ferguson Roker, Metalworker, Solemn, Golos, Worm Coil, Battlesphere. Blightsteel, Emrakul, Sundering, and two Ulmogs. I have pretty much the same configuration. I still have Kozilek. Uh, butcher of truth because i think i think annihilator four is annihilator four and i think the decks that cheat these guys into play and attack with them like sneak attack or through the breach want all the eldrazi with annihilator four to hit so those are like kind of where you want to be <laughs> i also have triplicate titan um matt doesn't seem to but he does have flash doesn't he interesting so flash but no triplicate titan which I do think is one of the better hits you can make. Making three three threes is pretty good. And also um, you can get in there for nine if you sneak it or something. Um, I also have Cogworks Librarian, which is kind of just like a, a fun of. For those who don't know, Cogwork is a conspiracy card. As you draft a card, you may draft an additional card from that booster pack. If you do put Cogwork Librarian into that booster pack. So as you're drafting, you're like, okay, I'll take Cogwork Librarian. That'll be my pick. And I draft it face up. Any future pack, if there's two cards you want, you can take them both and replace the second card with the Cogwork Librarian so someone else can get it. And it's just kind of like a mini game in the actual drafting process. It's unlikely you ever play this guy as a 3-3 for 4, but it makes drafting a little more fun and a little more interactive. 
So I have four Planeswalkers. Matt has two. He has Ugin, the Spirit Dragon, and Karn, Scion of Urza. I have Ugin, the Ineffable, which I think is fantastic. So color spells cost two less, which is already great in cube. <laughs> I mean, you know, your that that includes your Eldrazi, that includes your Sundering Titans, your Battle Spheres, your Talismans are free. Uh, plus one, exile the top card of your library, make a 2-2. Two, two. Uh, when it leaves the battlefield, the exile card goes in your hand. So you make two twos, and then if they kill them, you draw that card. And then negative three just destroys a permanent if it's one or more colors. Like, this is probably one of the my favorite Planeswalkers, this Ugin. And I really like uh, this version a lot. However, it's only available in foil, which is unfortunate. I'm really disappointed when they do that nonsense. But I also have Karn Liberated. Because I, I think Karn is still just a fantastic Planeswalker to have in the cube. Uh, as for artifacts, I don't have Chrome Mox because I think it's actual garbage. <laughs> like, I literally never want to discard a permanent or a, or a spell to imprint on this. And I never want to be restricted by the spell I imprint. So, like, I never want to discard a blue card imprint a blue card and then be like oh i can only tap this for blue that sucks i need a black source that's why mox diamond is just better um because it just adds any color it doesn't care what what the land you discarded does um but yeah chromox is another card that like it's it was it was a really strong card in magic's history but it's just not very good <laughs> it's just no one's ever like i, I feel like no one is ever taking chromox very highly I think I've played about Chrome. I think I played against Chrome Locks maybe once in the Vintage Cube, <laughs> and it, you know if they bounce it, it just kind of sucks. You're losing two permanents. Eh. I also have Chalice. I don't have Lion's Eye Diamond, but that's just because I don't. I don't have a big Storm component in my cube, so I don't really care about it too much. The only thing I think it's really good for is Echo of Eons when I don't in my cube. Matt does, so I think it's totally fine here. Lotus Petal's good. I have Mana Crypt. I don't have Mishra's Bauble. It's kind of the same reason I don't have Git Probe. I know they're both great cards, but I just have this real issue with, like... I'm more of a... I like having fun and doing interactive things and playing cool spells more than I like just, like, making the most hyper-competitive, efficient drafting deck machine. Like, I don't know. It's just, like, this card doesn't do anything. <laughs> You sacrifice you lose the top card and you draw a card. You're either you're either playing this card to fulfill criteria for like Talarian Academy, or you're just playing it as a fifty nine a sixtieth card a fortieth card to just draw a card. It makes you play a thirty nine card deck. Those are the only reasons to play Mishra's Bobble. It just doesn't do anything. So I just I'd rather play like and, and when the cube is so limited, there's only five hundred and forty cards. I would rather put a card that players are excited about taking. Than a, than a card players are just like begrudgingly taking because it's good. I don't know. Mox Diamond and then the five Moxes and Zoran Orb. That's what I have as well. I don't have Candelabra, but I just don't have one right now. I'd probably add it if I had it because I do like the interactions with like Talarian Academy or Gaia's Cradle or just being able to fix your mana. Honestly, I don't know if it does enough. Like, only working, like, it really only works with, like, the Talarian Academy and Gaia's Cradle decks that are pumping out a bunch of mana. If you don't have those, it's not great. I don't know. Uh, I have Currency Converter. So does Matt. I have Mana Vault. I have Retrofitter. I have Top. I have Skull Clamp. And I have Soaring. So pretty much the same other than Candelabra, which I'm still on the fence about. Grim Monolith. Uh, Helm, I don't have Helm, but just because, again, I don't have a huge Storm component, so it's just really kind of going to waste. I don't have Pentad Prism. Uh, I have Bankbuster. I have Smugglers, Jitte. I don't have Unlicensed Hearse, which is pretty good. I actually like Unlicensed Hearse a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I took Winter Orb out, though, because it's actually garbage, and it's just not a fun card. Like, I've, I've leaned towards taking out a lot of the less fun cards, um, like, I wonder if Matt still has, like, smokestack and stuff in the cube, or, like, it doesn't look like it. But, like, a lot of those cards just aren't fun. And, like, I don't know. Winter Orb just makes the game less fun. Like, Vintage Cube is already so busted, and, like, you're already having, like, so many broken interactions and uphill battles that, like, make the games that you're playing, like, fun and interactive and, like, 
like if my opponent goes turn two channel Emrakul, like that's cool, but I don't need to be winter orbing and making sure our game lasts for 40 more turns. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's there's, there's fun broken ways to win and there's unfun broken ways to win. And winter orb definitely falls into the unfun way. So I just took it out. Uh, other than that, I have all of the talismans under here. It looks like Matt still has signets, which are weird because I, I I'm pretty sure these are 100% absolutely garbage compared to talismans after having played with talismans i'm just significantly impressed with them um yeah yeah uh yeah so basalt monolith coalition relic crucible and palantir i have most of these i have chromatic lantern as well uh, because again, I have a five color theme in my cube. So I want to make sure that all the cards are castable. People can take that and then tap their lands for any mana. So you can play like niv Mizzet Reborn or Hellkite. Um, what's that card called? Two-headed Hellkite or, you know, Jared Carthalion, the Planeswalker. That's five colors. So yeah, I just made sure that there's like a, a couple ways. I also have Sword of Body in mind, Sword of Feast and Famine, and Sword of Fire and Ice still. And I still have worn Power Stone, which it doesn't look like Matt has. I also took out Crucible of Worlds and replaced it with, uh, where is it? <laughs> you know the one, Conduit of Conduit of Worlds. So that's just basically a straight up replacement. I feel like most of the decks in my experience that were playing uh, Strip Mine, Wasteland, Crucible, things like that were green decks as well. It's It feels uncommon that you're gonna be playing it without green. Yeah, so interestingly small. I have, he only has four three drops. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I have eight. So I have three swords and a worn power stone and a chromatic and a chromatic lantern more. And he has the crucible. Aether Flux Reservoir, Mystic Forge, One Ring, and Thran Dynamo. I have Mystic Forge, One Ring, and Relic of Sauron, which I just recently replaced Thran Dynamo with. So basically you're adding two mana in any combination of blue, black, or red instead of three colorless mana. So you get one fewer mana, but being able to tap this and remand something or mana drain something, um, the turn you play it is very strong. Plus for three mana and a tap, you just get to draw two discard one. You just get to like compulsive research or like that's just really strong. And it just feels like a significant upgrade to Thran Dynamo, which is only producing colorless. Yeah, so, I mean, this also helps if you wanna cast something like Cruel Ultimatum or Inspired Ultimatum and you need like a red or a blue or a black. So it's just a more versatile version that I think is a solid upgrade because of the the upside. Um, Batter Skull and Timeless Lotus are my, my cards. I just recently took Memory Jar out for a bunch of Eldrazi cards, which I, I'm gonna go over soon. But yeah, Batter Skull's still in here for him. I have Timeless Lotus because I just, again, it's just really good for the five color deck that I'm that I'm trying to encourage in the cube. It's it was either that or like Gilded Lotus. So I think Timeless Lotus was just better for what I wanted to do. Uh then he has Cauldre Complete and Portal to Phyrexia and Mind Slaver. I don't have Mind Slaver. Because I figured if I cut Mind Slaver, I can also cut Academy Ruins. I think both of them are kind of... Like, I'd be curious to see the numbers, quite honestly. But I'm pretty sure both of them are extremely low picks that don't get played very frequently. And I think those are the cards that you want to cut the most. The cards that just people aren't excited about playing. Like, Mind Slaver goes super late. I'll take it. Sometimes I'll play it. But if I don't get Academy Ruins, I'm much less excited about playing it. So it's just an easy two cuts that give me two more slots in the cube for something more exciting. I don't have Portal to Phyrexia in mind, but I could definitely see including it. And I do have Cauldre Complete. Portal to Phyrexia is interesting. It goes with a lot of things. You can tinker, you can channel. Um, I mean, those are two big ones. Those are, the, those, are the two, those are the two exciting ones. And then we have all the Simics, the Signets down here, which I, I do think should be replaced by Talismans. I think Talismans are far and away better than signets i think signets are super awkward and 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 they they kind of make this awkward play experience like I, even tonight i did a stream and i had a match where my opponent was able to go talisman 
tap the talisman for a color and play something else that turn. And if it was a signet instead, they wouldn't have been able to do that because they needed one colored mana from the talisman and then one mana that the talisman didn't provide. And they had that, but they would have had to use the mana that it didn't provide in order to activate it if it was a signet. It's just, it makes mana so much smoother, but not without a cost. It's a, they're, 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 su they're super balanced is what I guess what I'm saying. Uh, the talismans, not the signets. So yeah, definitely I would consider replacing those. And that's pretty much my thoughts on the green cards and the artifacts. Let me know what you guys think. I would love to hear your opinions. Definitely consider subscribing or following if you're watching on, I guess that's the same thing on YouTube. So definitely consider subscribing if you're on YouTube or add a like, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about my choices, what you think about match choices. Um, I would love to hear them. I love discussing Vintage Cube. And uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.